Hello, and welcome to this edition of Take 5 with Tony. Well, another really important point that folks who promote genetically modified foods make is that they say that you don't have to worry about the safety of the foods because actually the genetic modification process, it's just like a continuation of what farmers and scientists have been doing for millennium. They've been trading genetic material among plants, and there's nothing significantly different between genetic modification and other forms of breeding. In fact, not long ago, the National Academy of Sciences said that there was no conceptual difference between genetic modification and other forms of breeding. Well, what does traditional breeding entail? Well, you have farmers who save seeds through open pollination of bees and other pollinators, and more recently, in the last 50 years, has been the growth of hybrids. Now, hybrid is a little bit different from open pollination, but a hybrid still involves the reproductive parts of a plant. It still involves exchanging pollen between a male flower and a female flower, and in the case of a hybrid, it's done carefully to select for certain traits from one type of plant to another. Now, what about genetic engineering and genetically modified plants? Is that also about the same? Well, you'll hear proponents say that actually it's more precise and safer than traditional breeding methods like hybridization. And they'll talk about gene splicing. And when you hear gene splicing, you probably think of a very precise process of moving tissue from one species to another. Let's look at that. Watermelons are wonderfully sweet, but they only last a couple of weeks in storage. What if you wanted to get much longer storage and you, just, you found the trait in a potato that you wanted to take out of the potato, put into the watermelon, so you have a sweet watermelon that lasts months instead of a couple of weeks. Here's what we think genetic engineering is. A splice of tissue from the potato, isolating the gene, and a splice into the recipient, the watermelon, to receive that tissue. That's at least the notion we have of gene splicing and its precision. In truth, the process of entering genes from one species to another in genetic engineering is more like this. Put the tissue into the chamber, lock it up, That's genetic engineering. Honest. A gene gun is used to insert the material from one foreign species into another recipient species. In fact, in the early days of genetic engineering, they actually used a 22 caliber gun. Now they're a little more finesse, but it's still a gun that is powered by air that fires the genetic material into the other organism. Now let's talk about why they do that. First of all, with genetic engineering, remember that you're taking samples and tissue and genetic material from completely unrelated species, not two types of squash or two types of cucumber, but from things that have no relation in nature. Now, the species that's getting that genetic material, it either doesn't recognize it or it tries to fight it off as it does any invader. So not only do they shoot the material into the tissue, but they have to add a promoter, an unnatural promoter, and they use a virus. So you have three or four completely foreign genes packaged together in what the scientists called a cassette and then propelled by force randomly into the recipient material. That is the truth of what the genetic engineering process looks like in practice. Given that, it's not at all surprising that unexpected occurrences, mutations, viral responses, essentially allergic responses, have been detected in the recipient organism, but also in some of the animals and people consuming these materials. Because when you invade an organism with viruses and antibiotics and lots of sheer force, it's only expected that you would get lots of disturbances and, and changes that are above and beyond the particular trait you are trying to instill. The notion that genetic engineering is simply a continuation of millennial process of manipulating different varieties is such a great misrepresentation that I think we could fairly call it a lie. Thank you and we'll see you next time.